All right. There we go. All righty, everybody. Um, welcome to our um, third week of our Burning Bonanza Lunch and Learn series. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are really excited about this series. Um, we've been getting really great feedback, and today I think it's going to be a great, um, a great presentation as well. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Um, one, just a reminder that this, um, that this session will be going on until March 10th will be the last one. Um, and we're already looking at planning um, another session um, to go for April and May as well. I think that one's gonna be a little bit more focused on citizen science. So we've got some great ideas for that and working on getting some people in. Um, I do want to thank um, the Visit Bucks County and the Bucks County Foundation for their financial support um, of these programs. Um, they've been very generous to us and we appreciate that. Um, and also remind people that if you are looking to get out, although probably not today, since it's actually still snowing at my house, um, <laughs> the grounds are open dawn to dusk every day um, at, at Bucks Audubon and we definitely welcome people to come and explore and connect with nature. So, so hopefully everyone will get a chance to do that. Um, today we are very lucky um, to have Matt, who is from Washington's Crossing um, Park with us um, to talk about backyard birding and I'm gonna let him take it away. So welcome Matt um, and thank you so much for being with us today. Hello and, and welcome everybody. Uh, happy afternoon officially now, the day after what most people know as Groundhog Day, right? But if you're uh, big into cultural history like I am, you know February 2nd, the midway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox is actually Candlemas Day. If you've never heard of Candlemas Day, I suggest after this uh, presentation, go and, and uh, Google it, research Candlemas Day and, and see how how there have been some influences from uh, German cultures, uh, pagan history, as well as Native Americans that all mixed to create what we now know as Groundhog Day. Pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm so excited to be here. We're going to have some fun. Uh, we're going to talk about backyard birding and how to attract, potentially attract more birds to your backyard. Uh, just out of curiosity, before we get started, I know you're all muted, but there is a chat box feature is anybody tuning in today from outside of Bucks County? Is there anybody outside of Bucks County today? That'd be awesome. If you are, just type it in. That'd be neat to see in that time while you're deciding whether you're or not you want to type something in that chat box. I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna get started. I have a PowerPoint here for all of you today on backyard birding. And I'm just gonna move a few items off of my screen so I could see better. All right, perfect. So a lot of my pictures from my PowerPoint today uh, are ones that I took of, of the landscape. So you'll get to do some exploring with me, not just throughout Pennsylvania, but throughout North America as we learn more about backyard birding. So thank you again. My name is Matt Truesdale. I am what the Bureau of State Parks, DCNR, entitles an environmental education specialist, which means I wear a uh, uniform just like a ranger does at a state park. However, I am not equipped with any law enforcement abilities. I am the fun guy, just like that mushroom you see out in a state park. I get to do all the cool stuff and teach people all about hiking, backpacking, snakes, birds, fishing, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, the picture you're looking at today is actually, I took that while I was working at King's Gap Environmental Education Center near Carlisle. That's at the Pole Steeple Vista um, in Pine Grove Furnace State Park in the Michaux State Forest. If you've never been there, um, I definitely suggest it. It's one of my parks I highlight at the end uh, to go to for uh, some birding if you, if you want to get away for a little weekend trip. Um, but that's Pole Steeple, very, very beautiful, picturesque location. So a little bit about myself before we get into uh, the presentation today. So I love the outdoors. I'm sure all of you are here because of your love for the outdoors as well. So besides birding and bird watching, I really love fly fishing. It's a brown trout caught up in the Pennsylvania wilds at Kettle Creek. Here's me while I was employed at Bald Eagle State Park with a red phased Eastern screech owl that happened to show up. He was injured, but no worries. We got him taken care of. Uh, that day. And of course, the fun stuff, the recreational side of things, that's uh, myself back uh, about five, six years ago, leading a group down the Lehigh Gorge at Lehigh uh, Gorge State Park, the river there, Lehigh River, lots of fun stuff. And I even had the opportunity back in the day to educate Tom Corbett 
himself, the governor of Pennsylvania, how to geocache. And he's even quoted at saying, it's pretty neat. So how about that? All right. I've been involved with the Bureau of State Parks um, on and off now, you could say, since 2011. I'm currently at Washington Crossing Historic Park. Uh, I mentioned before some time I spent some time at Kings Gap Environmental Education Center, as well as Bald Eagle State Park. But I've also had the opportunity to travel around to both uh, Texas, live in Texas, as well as Boulder, Colorado for a while. But here at Washington Crossing Historic Park, we're very unique in a lot of different ways. I'm going to highlight some of those ways through today's presentation. One of those ways is we are one of the newest state parks within DCNR. So about five years ago, DCNR acquired the property here from the Pennsylvania uh, Historic Museum Council, the PHMC. Um, and uh, Washington Crossing Historic Park on the Pennsylvania side is now part of uh, the 121 State Parks, Bureau of State Parks of Pennsylvania. If you were to Google or research Washington Crossing Historic Park, you'd have two different websites pop up. The first one being our DCNR website, but we also have an amazing friends group that does a ton of awesome volunteer work for us here at the park, whether it's helping to educate the public for our school programs or uh, the history component as what a lot of people know us for. Um, this area is, is where George Washington and his troops spent uh, Christmas Eve into Christmas before crossing the Delaware with those Durham boats in order to attack the Hessians um, and eventually, which was the major catalyst to us gaining our freedom um, as, as Americans. But this park has a lot more to offer also. So that's what my involvement is. And for the past year or so, I've been doing my best to slowly start to build up an educational component, um, as well as a recreational component to the programming's, uh, programs offered here. A couple examples, uh, waterfowl watches. So if you're close by um, and want to sign up for any of our programs, uh, send me an email. My information is going to be included at the end of this. Um, and I'll get you on my email newsletter for some opportunities, whether it's waterfowl watches, night hikes, or even our bluebird monitoring program, or what's now known as the cavity trail nesting program that we have at the park. I'll be doing a special program on this later in February. Um, and if you want the opportunity to take home a kit for yourself, you'll have that opportunity. Just tune in and, and remind me, I'll, I'll mention that at the very end also. And what a beautiful picturesque scene right here. Um, yeah, that's Bowman Tower in the bottom left corner overlooking the Delaware River. So pretty, I don't know why you would not wanna visit this place. So why birding? I know a lot of you probably are already involved with birding and probably consider yourself experts, but if those um, people who are new to birding, why, why should we get into birding? Because birding, you could do it anywhere. And that's what I love about birding. Um, earlier I mentioned I'd share some pictures with you um, throughout my time across the country while birding. So here's, uh, here's some pictures. Here's down in the Gulf of Mexico where I've been bird watching before. The Chihuahuan Desert in Southwest Texas, which is also home to Big Bend National Park. Oh, it's awesome seeing the Roadrunners and the quail and the Scots Orioles down in that part of the country. Rocky Mountain National Park, of course the flat irons and boulder. And what's great about birding is, as you all know, I, I mentioned earlier, I love fishing. I love, I like doing a lot of things outside. While I'm doing those things, if the fish aren't biting or, you know what, it's a, a boring hike, there's always birds to look and, and listen for. Of course, here's some very nice, beautiful uh, scenery up at Letchworth State Park in New York, known as the uh, Grand Canyon of New York. And Pennsylvania, here we go. This is down in Boiling Springs, uh, Pennsylvania, looking for wood ducks and all the mallards and mergansers down, uh, down along the stream. So here we go. So there are things, characteristics, right, that, that make up everything. So if you think of an insect, the characteristics that make up an insect are that it has three body parts, six legs, it has antenna. How about Birds. Are there any characteristics for birds? Can you think of what makes a bird a bird? And if you know some of those, if you want to type them in the chat, that's fine. If if not, that's fine. We'll learn some together as well. So what do we see? Can anybody see first off the picture? <coughs> Excuse me. How well camouflaged that screech owl is. So what makes a bird a bird? Let's take a look here. <coughs> So all birds 
have feathers, of course. All birds lay eggs. All birds, what do we have going on here? All birds make nests and a variety of different kinds of nests. You can see some of the hanging nests like the Orioles make all the way down to the little tiny hummingbird nests. So all birds make nests, but what about, what about flight? Can all birds fly? Well, not all birds can fly. And with nature, there's always the exception, right? So just because you're a bird, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't mean that you necessarily can fly, but you have all those other characteristics in common. The laying the eggs, the feathers. In North America, we have no native flightless birds. So you don't have to worry about any uh, native birds running around on the ground. All of our birds can fly. <clears throat> so how do we attract those birds to our backyard? How do we attract those birds that can fly to our backyard? Well, it's with anything, right? If we think of anything in nature that's living, excuse me one second, I got a uh, <coughs> cough in my throat. <clears throat> if we think about any natural living thing, ourselves included, we all have basic needs. One basic need that I probably could use right now is a glass of water, but that's okay. I'm going to get through this without any problem. But what are those basic needs? Food, ha, how about that? Water, air, <clears throat> shelter, in space. If you want to attract more birds to back to your backyard, we're going to focus on three of those. The big three, as I call them. We're going to focus on water. We're going to focus on shelter as well as food. We can't really have much of an influence on air. And you could kind of say shelter and space have um, the same connection. And, but space is all dependent, right? You might have a lot of space in your backyard. You might not have a lot of space in your backyard, but there's still ways that you can, depending on the space you have, attract more birds. So let's take a look at those big three, that food, water, and shelter. Now, of course, keep in mind that all birds are different, right? Just like us, just like other animals. So all birds are different. They're not gonna eat the same thing. If you take a look at these two different beak pictures, <clears throat> now, these are not all the beaks that you can find on birds, but they're different, right? So when it comes to food and feeders, you might want to specialize or focus on the type of food that you're providing at your feeders. And if you can, try to buy from a local wildlife store or feed mill because they will have sometimes better quality <laughs> food and also food that might not have some fillers that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Now, each one of my bird pictures for fun, I do uh, identify, so you'll be able to follow along. So we got Northern Cardinals here at this feeder. We got American Goldfinch, Dark-Eyed Junco down there, as well as some Pine Siskins. All right, so here we go. In the food specifically, we'll start with sunflower. So with sunflower, there could be two different kinds. You could have black oil, <clears throat> which is the most popular uh, type of sunflower. Now, it's a very thin shell. Literally just about every bird could eat black oil sunflower. There's also striped sunflower, which is a little bit harder uh, of a shell to get into. So some birds might have more difficulty with opening this. So it might, um, when you're determining what type of sunflower you get and what birds you want to attract, you might have a, a, a preference as to which sunflower you would like. And I do see some people taking notes. That's awesome, great, I appreciate that. You're also going to be provided with a reference sheet that I made that includes uh, notes and links to all of this information I'm sharing with you today. And you're gonna be emailed that um, by the end of this program, just in case you, you might miss something. So what type of feeders do we wanna use for sunflower? We wanna use tube feeders. And sunflower is even light enough that it's great for the, the window uh, clings, the window feeders that you could put on your window and get a real good close up for some birds. So what do we have here? We got some tufted titmice down at that cylindrical feeder, another northern cardinal and a ah, goldfinch there, nicely brightly colored up, must be spring in that picture. All right, what's next? We're going on to safflower. It's like sunflower, but it's a white version. So you could say it's like the bleached, it almost looks like bleached. Um, 
sunflower, which is great. And it's much more difficult for birds to uh, get into safflower than sunflower. So this would be a great type of seed if you're trying to attract uh, the, the gross speaks, like the evening gross speaks or even uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, rose-breasted gross speaks, sorry. Uh, fell through my mind there for a second. And you can see here that safflower is good for tray types of feeders. You have feeder tray types that you could even uh, hang on your banisters now, or even hang like a uh, hanging, hanging plant. So we got Northern Cardinals, Downy Woodpeckers. There's that rose-breasted grosbeak I mentioned earlier, all birds that would definitely eat safflower. All right, moving on. We have Niger, which a lot of people call thistle. Is that a correct word for this type of seed? Well, maybe, maybe not. It just depends on how you look at things. So Niger is actually a type of seed that is not um, from North America. And the reason being is because of thistle and so many invasive thistles, an issue with invasive thistles, the thought was to, instead of trying to uh, produce and sell native uh, um, thistle as seed, we could go uh, for, a, for a Niger. And it is uh, produced in a way that it will not spread itself as a plant here um, in, in the States if it fall, when it falls down to the ground and, and potentially doesn't get eaten. But this time of year is perfect to feed Niger to your birds out in the winter time, especially for those pine siskins like these guys, or even the um, uh, the the uh, American goldfinches that are that are out and about in numbers. Now these this Niger though, you'll go through probably a good bit of it because these type of birds that are eating this this feed uh, hammer it and really chow down. Uh, Sox type feeders or cylindrical tubes that have very thin mesh or wire would be great. And I know we're gonna get into this a little bit down the road, but feed Niger and plant native thistle. So something to keep in mind, the feed Niger and plant native thistle. We'll get to plant things here in a little bit. Moving on to white millet. Okay, some people call this uh, uh, sorghum, but it's actually its own thing, white millet. Now, it is a great feed, not only in your feeders or seed for your feeders, but also to spread around on the ground. So suggested uh, feeders for white millet, a tube, even platform feeder, somewhere that stays pretty well drained, okay? And also to spread some of this on the ground around your feeders too, because this is a ground type of seed for those ground feeding birds also. And heck, you might even get a, a fun little bird uh, at your feeder, one of my favorite, the wood ducks, they'll like this. So look at that guy hanging out at that feeder next to that red wing blackbird, how neat, wood ducks. All right, peanuts. The game rolls on. We're going down that batting order and we're now at peanuts. One of my more favorite fun things uh, to feed uh, birds, mostly because I like to watch bird behavior and how they're trying to get the get the seed or the food out from whatever feeder it is that you have it in. Peanuts are great for a large variety of different birds, but specifically your nut hatches. Like there's a white breasted nut hatch down below. Red breasted nut hatch will also go after peanuts. Of course, uh, blue jays love peanuts as well as uh, woodpeckers. So here we got a red bellied woodpecker as well as a downy woodpecker. And you could put your peanuts, they could either be in the shell, they could be crushed like the picture is right there, or they could even be whole out of the shell. Birds will find a way to get at that peanut and eat it for sure. I love feeding peanuts. Like I said, woodpeckers are one of my, I like all birds, of course, but woodpeckers are one of my favorites. So let's move on to suet. Another great uh, food item that you could be putting out this time of year because it is so dense and packed full of nutrition, especially during these colder times of the year, these cold months. And with all the snow that we got recently, uh, these birds will really appreciate if there's some suet out there to really help give them some uh, energy, so, uh, some extra uh, warmth, if you will, packing on those calories and proteins. Uh, definitely use a cage for suet. Uh, here's, we got a red breasted nut hatch as well as a red headed woodpecker taking at some suet uh, right there in those cages. Now, just be cautious in the summertime, 
if you're if it gets above 70 degrees just be mindful where you're storing your sous i actually put mine in the refrigerator in the summertime because as the warmer it gets as you see there's the potential for it uh to become unuseful rancid uh, additionally if it's out in the sun too long it could get stuck to birds feathers which is, is very dangerous for the birds so make sure you're only uh using sue at certain times of years and, and those other times are making sure it gets stored in a cool uh location so some other fun food and fun feeders besides what we talked about already this is a big favorite of mine a lot of people down in south Eastern Pennsylvania is to put out uh, uh, oranges for Orioles, whether they're Baltimore Orioles or the Orchard Orioles. I've seen both feed at orange feeders. And that that Oriole, you can see he's even uh, eating some grape jelly. So grape jelly is also a great uh, source, food source for those Orioles. It not only gives them some sugar, some extra um, energy, but that, that grape jelly is also going to attract insects. Uh, into it as well. So they're getting some protein with their sugar, which is always good. How about bugs? Mealworms are perfect for a lot of different birds like eastern bluebirds or purple martins or tree swallows. And you can see there's a nifty little uh, mealworm feeder inside that mason jar. That looks pretty cool. Love to have one of those. And of course, for our hummers, the hummingbirds, uh, let's make sure when, whenever we're making our sugar for our hummingbird feeders um, that we're not using any of the red dye, um, but we're just using just a straight mixture for uh, parts water with one part sugar and we're mixing that up uh, nice and good. Now, two, <clears throat> same thing with your sugar water as a suet, make sure you keep it stored um, in a cool place. Uh, even though sugar is a preservative, it can potentially go bad depending on how long you have uh, your sugar water stored and where you have it stored also. So yep, Baltimore Oriole, Eastern Bluebird, and Ruby Throated Hummingbird. Earlier I mentioned fillers, and this comes with a lot of the pre-made store-bought feed that you find at any of the big box stores. Um, not to say that this isn't uh, a good starting uh, mix or a good place to start if you're new into birding, but just keep in mind a lot of the pre-made, um, pre-mixed bird, the general bird mixes that you can get are, are full of a lot of filler that uh, some birds will still eat, but it will also attract maybe some pests that you might not want at your feeder or even birds that you might not want at your feeder uh, also. So here you could see there's there's that red milo or that sorghum. We don't we don't want that in necessarily in our wild bird mix if we could uh, purchase, like I mentioned earlier, at a feed store or a, a, a local wildlife store. And there's also wheat in there too. So make sure uh, if you're making your own mix or buying your, your bird mixes or bird seed, we're, we're getting that good, that really good healthy type of food, not so much the junk or the filler as I'll call it. So moving on from food, we talked a lot about food, a lot about feeders. You might have some questions. That's cool. Hang on to them. I'll get to those here in a little bit. But how else can we attract birds to our backyard other than food? Well, your next ingredient is H2O. Of course, we just know that as water. And as you see, Martha Stewart says, yes, it's truly that easy. Just add water and you could potentially have more birds in your backyard. So what do I mean? by adding water. So let's think about water features. So a good water source sometimes is even better than a good food source for your backyard to attract birds. The placement too, just keep in mind, just with your feeders, placement's critical. We don't wanna be placing our water source necessarily out in the middle of the open, uh, unless you wanna to try to attract uh, a hawk to come down and maybe uh, get a, a northern cardinal like that at your feeder. But um, if you're trying to, to attract to keep birds to your backyard in a, in a good amount, let's make sure we're giving those um, birds a safe spot to whether it's bathe or preen like this. Some features, water features that you can include in your backyard other than bird baths is they now make a bird misters, just like this one right here. Uh, look at that mister on that little ruby throated hummingbird. You could also put a small pond if you want. Uh, and if you have the space, like I mentioned earlier, space, you could even incorporate some other features to your backyard that all birds would appreciate. So I mentioned that we have that Northern Cardinal right there enjoying a bath, <clears throat> Ruby throated a hummingbird and that mister. 
Look at this. Look at that guy, that Blue Jay. And what's he have in his mouth there? He even has a peanut. Looks like he's dipping off in that water feature. Ah, this is a cool one. I had to include this. You typically will not see a hooded Oriole in uh, Pennsylvania. There's always crazy things that happen, right? But I could not help myself from including this hooded Oriole picture in the water feature. So adding water is definitely going to uh, bring more birds um, to your backyard. Now let's talk a little bit about shelter and I'm not going to get involved or talk a lot about houses or bird homes today, um, but what I'm going to emphasize are plantings. So native plantings, Pennsylvania native species, as well as a biodiversity. So when I say biodiversity, when you think about it and you break that word down, bio, life, diversity, lots of, you want a, lots of different type of native life in your backyard to attract not just birds, but all, all sorts of uh, wild living species, native species. We have a very unique um, part, portion of our park here at Washington Crossing called the Bowman Hill Wildflower Preserve, which is a really awesome place to check out hike around if you're ever down in this area. But what they also provide on their website is an amazing, awesome list of native plants that you could plant in your backyard to attract birds. And it breaks it down um, as far as it could go here for you. Like I said earlier, don't worry about trying to write all this down. Maybe if you have a photographic memory, all power to you, take a picture right now, but I'm including the links to um, these resources in those notes that I had mentioned. So you'll be able to to get all this at the very end. <clears throat> Other than planting native species in your backyard, we could also compost, okay? And establishing an outdoor compost system creates a biosphere. And with that biosphere, you're gonna create naturally lots of different little tiny organisms living within your open compost. The next two pictures I was fortunate enough to take before all this snow. These pictures of our, our composter, our open composters here at the park that we put a lot of our uh, garden uh, material in our leftover leaf litter, our coffee grounds, things like that to help break down. But when you're creating a compost, by I mentioned you're creating a biosphere, you are creating more insects, opportunity for more insects to thrive and live, to break down that compost, to make it awesome for your plants and garden in the future. But you're also encouraging life and growth. And with that, you're encouraging potentially more birds to come and pick off those insects as they uh, are living and, and evolving. Uh, they're, they're going through their life cycle in that compost. And composting is such a big thing um, that birds in bloom, I put this in here because birds in bloom wrote an article about gardening and how it could uh, improve your, not just your, your the backyard, your native plantings, but also your bird um, and wildlife activity also. Some more information about gardening or I'm sorry, composting from fine gardening. Just make sure you're recycling a, and <clears throat> composting organic materials and food scraps. There is a chance, I know a lot of people get apprehensive about uh, composting because of the potential to attract other undesirable wildlife to your property, which is potentially true. But if you follow the easy steps and make sure you're only putting in uh, your, your garden material, your leaf litter, um, very few scraps uh, from a, your kitchen table, you'll, you'll do an awesome job. Now, not only I mentioned is this good for birds, but with our bats right now, you're going to be helping improve bat habitat and bat food. And that's right, just like this little brown bat says, that is totally off the food chain right there. So composting is not just good for you, your garden, but so many other things. I encourage you to try uh, to, to, to make an outdoor composting um, project if you're able to, if you're able to. So some pests and protocol with birding, bird watching, establishing these opportunities in your backyard, you're going to have pests, okay? It's inevitable. So you're going to have squirrels like this guy or girl. You're going to have raccoons like this one right here doing some theatrics. You might even get a bear. Look at this bear balancing himself on top of that platform feeder. I, I just had to include that picture in here. From my experience, <clears throat> there's no such thing as a pest proof bird feeder. We've gone over some tips and tricks to help prevent pests 
with the feed and seed that you can get. But regardless, you're always going to have a, a pest of some kind. Uh, it's inevitable, right? So how do we potentially prevent that? Well, the best thing you could do is just try to remember to bring your feeders in each night. We all have, let me grab mine. We all have these now, right? These smartphones, just set a reminder on your phone every day to make sure you go out and take your uh, bird feeders in for the night. And that will also help with what we get to next, the cleaning aspect of things, because bird feeders, if left unkempt, could potentially spread disease. And what diseases or illnesses am I talking about? Salmonella? <clears throat> I can't pronounce that one. Trico, trick, we'll just call it that. I can't, honestly, I'm not good at pronouncing half of these, but I could pronounce avian pox, that's an easy one, and mites and lice. So just remember that clean feeders, clean and happy feeders produce clean and happy birds. So even after you purchase a feeder for the first time, I definitely suggest washing it out cleaning it out and make it a routine, make it part of your day. Um, but not necessarily your day, but you just wanna keep an eye on your feeder daily to make sure that uh, it's staying good and healthy and clean because we don't wanna potentially be spreading any diseases to our birds in our backyard because that would potentially decrease what we wanna see, right? So even if you have um, bird houses, it's good to uh, every year during uh, the winter time, this time, take them down. I just uh, did our 25 cavity nesting boxes, took them down, uh, cleaned them out, made sure they were good for the next year. Even the platform feeders that you had, make sure they get a good scrape for sure. Now, talked a lot about attracting birds to your backyard, which is awesome because we want to have those experiences maybe from our house, right? But if you're looking to go on uh, an adventure, whether it's this year, next year, or any time in the future, the Bureau of State Parks is broken down into four regions, north, south, east, and west. And here is just one example of a great birding location in each one of those regions. We have, oops, what's going on here? Oh, okay, sorry, my computer froze for a sec. So the first one is Presque Isle State Park up in Erie. Uh, as you, this, this big long road here, this big long chain of land, that's the park itself, Presque Isle. It's an excellent park if you are into uh, wildlife, I'm sorry, um, waterfowl. <laughs> waterfowl is a part of wildlife, but if you're into waterfowl or even snowy owls, um, this time of year, usually in the winter now, I don't want to guarantee anything because there's no guarantees in nature, but Presque Isle is an excellent park to go for your waterfowl as well as they routinely get snowy um, owls, one, sometimes two um, in the winter time. So your best bet to potentially see one is up in Presque Isle. Another awesome park, somewhat close to uh, uh, where we are here in Bucks County. This is for the Eastern uh, portion of, of our regions here is Hickory Run State Park. It's got large uh, uh, con congruent forests up there. It's great spot, good spot for warblers and other forest interior birds like your thrushes, your wood thrushes, your hermit thrushes. And they got a really awesome uh, hiking scene up at Hickory Run also. They got a really cool boulder field if, if you're into geology, check that out. I mentioned earlier Pine Grove Furnace State Park, and this is a picture from that same uh, vantage point at the very beginning of my slides. This is that pole steeple lookout. I personally have heard barred owls, great horned owls, uh, red shoulder hawks, a ton of different birds, uh, indigo buntings, uh, awesome, awesome birding location. And that's in Cumberland County near Adams County, right next to the Adams County line. And then of course, Bald Eagle State Park. Bald Eagle State Park, if you were to look at a map of Pennsylvania, put your finger directly in the center, that's pretty much where Bald Eagle State Park is. So it's, it's right at the base, at the southernmost point of the Allegheny Front. And what you're seeing is the very beginning of the Ridge and Valley section of Pennsylvania. So it's awesome for eagles, osprey, um, all of the birds I mentioned earlier, as well as American woodcocks and northern shrikes. It's a very great park for northern shrikes that come down in the in the winter time, also. So just a quick um, few final notes here. Good ID resources if you don't have one already. Um, definitely get yourself one or two different types of 
books, right? So I have both the Peterson and the Sibley, not because um, I think one might be better than the other or what have you, but I like to compare and contrast the two. Uh, just because one bird is pictured a certain way in one resource doesn't mean that's how every single one of those is gonna look, right? So you wanna compare and contrast uh, your field guides. But what I also like is this Merlin bird identification application that you can get for your phone, both Apple or Android. And what's cool about the Merlin bird ID guide is if you see a bird and you're able to get a few of those field markings in your brain before it flies away, right? You're able to say, see size, color, shape, behavior, those type of things. You can go through that application. It'll ask you a series of questions at the end of those questions, it'll give you a list of potential species that that bird could be. And it's it's definitely worked for me. Out West, when I was in uh, Boulder, uh, I was hiking the flat irons and experienced a couple new birds, one of which I remember vividly is the Canyon Wren. And I was able to use the Merlin app to listen to uh, the call of, of uh, that Wren and then compare it to what I was hearing. And it was, it was uh, quite the experience. So I definitely suggest the Merlin bird ID. And that uh, brings me to the conclusion of my uh, presentation here today. I'd like to thank you for um, sharing and, and going along on this little adventure. Um, again, this is all my contact information, which you will be provided. So if you have any questions that might happen to pop up in your brain after today's presentation, don't hesitate to either um, shoot me an email, uh, give me a call on, on the office phone there, extension 109. Um, and earlier, quick, once again, I mentioned uh, this uh, month, I'll be doing a program on cavity nesting birds. And if you want your opportunity to uh, have or, or get your own cavity nest box kit to uh, construct and put up at your home, as well as be a part of another virtual uh, talk on cavity nesting species, definitely get in touch. Um, and I'll give you some more information on that. So again, thank you for uh, letting me participate today. So to have some fun, share some uh, of what I know with you. And if we have any questions um, at this point, I'll, I'll definitely be open to, to take any questions. And I will um, stop sharing my screen right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. That was fabulous. Um, if people want to take themselves off mute and ask questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, we're a small enough group, we can do that. Um, but that's some really great stuff. I don't think I've ever been to Pine Grove um, Furnace. I need to go there. <laughs> Those are some great pictures. Oh yeah, so Pine Grove Furnace, um, like I mentioned, in the Michaux State Forest, sits light, right along the Appalachian Trail. Um, so you could park there and you could hike, you know, in either direction and have an awesome time in the state forest, see a lot of different um, bird species, like I mentioned, too, as well as a lot of other cool uh, wildlife down down in the Michelle. So really, really great place to hang out. So, Matt, um, it's Carol here. I just had a quick question about woodpeckers um, and regulations, actually. How do I get the woodpeckers out of my attic and back into my 20 acres of land? <laughs> so. Sure, that's a great I question. Sorry, go ahead, was there more? Oh, no, I was just gonna say they've, I've got four different areas of the house where they've bored through the soffits and are living in my attic. So I'm letting them there for the winter, but I would like to rehome them. Sure. In my yard. So this this is what I would um, suggest to you. Um, when, uh, and, and of course, if, if they hap happen to be nesting or if you know they're nesting, you wanna wait until all the birds are fledged or what have you, they sh obviously will not be nesting this, this time of year in the winter time. Um, so if you even wanted to think about, if you know they're out of the house for sure, going with this, I would suggest that. But um, if you can uh, plug those holes, right? Whether it's mesh, um, wire, um, or boarding it up. And then what I would also do, it's a little trick that my, my Nana had um, back, back in Shimokin when I used to go visit her. She would hang um, uh, pythons with string, okay? In, in areas that mm -hmm. outside that um, are open to, to air moving them, right? And so when you hang those pythons, whether it's on your banister or your shutters or what have you, they're gonna get blown in the wind. They're gonna be reflective. They're gonna make noise. They're gonna prevent birds from wanting to come down and perch in those areas. So uh, a way that to not use any 
chemicals or things like that, I would yeah, suggest those two um, methods. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's see, any other question? I'll take a look through the chat here to see. Any other questions? I don't think I saw any in the chat. Um, I do, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned to protect, let's say like the peanuts from the animals at night. Is there anything to protect the peanuts from the squirrels eating them during the day? No, I, unfortunately, uh, pests at your bird feeder it's it's you you just have to come to the point where you're, you're accepting of that um, of course certain feeds are going to be more attractive to certain animals other than birds right so um if if you want the opportunity to see more woodpeckers or more birds that prefer those peanuts you're just going to have to uh understand that okay i might have some more uh squirrels or chipmunks or or what have you now um but at the end of the day, um, to help prevent the, the uh, habitual um, knowledge or to get the, the, the habit that some of these wild animals might get into, it's called imprinting, right? You could take those feeders um, out um, inside from outside and it will naturally allow the, the animals, the wild animals to, to dissipate. And hopefully you keep doing that enough, it will, it'll allow them to, okay, this isn't where I should be, I should go elsewhere. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All righty, if there are no other questions, Matt, again, thank you so much. Um, that was great. Lots of great things to think about. Um, this is a perfect time to do it. Winter is a great time to, to think and sort of plan for what you wanna you know, start doing outside in your yard, come um, slightly nicer weather when there's not a foot or, foot or so of snow. <laughs> Um, so great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, remember, um, next week, I, I'm already blanking on what the topic is for next week. I think it may be native plants um, for your backyard. Um, so hopefully we'll see everybody there. Um, again, thank you so much um, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody.